Hey, it's Jamie Scrimger. When I became a stepmom, I quickly realized that while moms are encouraged to keep it real, there's a big double standard when it comes to stepmoms. So I decided to start the conversation myself. Thriving as a stepmom doesn't just come from conversations about being a stepmom, though. Here, we dive into marriage, relationships, personal growth, and more. My mission? Inspire you to live a kick-ass life while bringing you along as I create my own. This is the Kick-Ass Stepmom Podcast. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Kick-Ass Stepmom Podcast. Okay, guys, interesting conversation coming at you today. So I have been really intrigued lately by the idea of just tapping into my more feminine energy and well, learning about the power of polarity in relationships. I've been just hearing women who I follow online and who I really admire talk about how there's so much power in tapping into that feminine energy and not feeling like they're in their masculine energy all the time, you know, just feeling more nurturing and calm and creative, just not so intense. Now, admittedly, I didn't fully understand the ins and outs of this concept and the conversation. But when I stumbled upon a relationship and intimacy coach, Jake Woodward on Instagram, I was like, okay, he's really into this. He's talking lots about it. I had to get him on the show. So Jake is a relationship and intimacy coach, as I said, and he is all about diving into the polarity of relationships and how women tapping into their feminine and men being in their masculine can really create stronger intimacy in relationships and just more satisfaction in life. I will say I wasn't totally sure where this conversation was going to go because to be honest, there are some ideas within this approach that uses language that I think could be very controversial, especially with the messaging around women's roles in society today. But I really enjoyed it and I learned so much. And I'm also going to be incorporating some of the communication strategies that Jake shared in how I communicate with Darren. So in this episode, we talk about how our childhood trauma can influence our levels of masculine and feminine as adults and how abandonment wounds specifically can emasculate men and lead to women being more in their masculine energy as you know a form of protection. We talk about a man's role in protecting his wife, how Jake thinks that boundaries should be set, his thoughts on husband's responsibility to protect stepmoms, protect their wives from issues with the ex, why you can't lead a healthy family until you become emotionally healthy yourself, why women aren't feeling safe with men, how to tap into your feminine, and where women's desire for control and, you know, sometimes nagging comes from. There's so much in this episode. It is so powerful. And honestly, if you're like, oh, I don't know about this masculine feminine energy thing, Highly recommend listening with an open mind. I do think there is something in here for everyone. And it was such a powerful conversation for me. So Jake Woodward on the podcast. Let's dive in. Jake, welcome to the podcast. I was just telling you offline, so excited. I just have so many questions about your work. So I'm so excited to tap into this today find myself lost in your Instagram, sending reels to my husband and having interesting conversations. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Yeah. Well, I'm honored you took the time. I think the best place to start, you want to just kind of give us a little bit of an intro into your work, you know, what it is you got going on. Yeah, I would love to. So basically <laughs> the short version, I would say, about 10 years ago, I was working at a job that I was very unfulfilled by. And now in many people's eyes, this would be quote unquote, like the dream job. I was on my way to becoming a lineman, which for those of that don't know, it's basically a person that works on high voltage wires. I went to school for it, got the training. I started with this company and every single day I was going to work, I was so unfulfilled and it just seemed like something was calling me to do something more. And Inside this job, I was surrounded by miserable, negative people that were just complaining about their lives, complaining about their relationships. And I would just find myself so miserable every single day going there. I was making good money. I was 23 years old at the time. I'm on my way up to six figures. You're like make a bank. But yeah, but there was a part of me that like my peace wasn't there. I wasn't fulfilled. And I remember I came across this word entrepreneurship and I'm like, what the hell does that even mean? So I started doing all this research. I read you know, a bunch of different books. I read this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. 
And like, I'm sitting there reading these books and like all my thoughts in my head were like in this book. I'm like, holy shit, like this is crazy. So I started out on this path. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to leave in six months. I'm going to quit this job. I'm out of here. I ended up leaving in six weeks and I had no, like basically no parachute when I jumped, if that makes sense. And I'm from this small farm town. So like, it's not a smart thing to do to like leave a really good job in a lot of people's opinions from where I come from like a good job with health benefits and pension and 401k. So I remember walking out the door, I kicked the door open. I'm like, I'm never coming back to this place, but I'm moving to my mom's basement. <laughs> so I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? But I had this vision that I really wanted to help people. And that was like always like the core function of who I am was like, I really want to serve people. I really want to help people. And I remember I started posting content on Facebook. And at the time I would go live and I had two people watching. And one was my best friend and the other one was my mom sitting upstairs. And I'd have to tell her during the live, I'm like, mom, you can't be on the internet right now. The internet's too slow because we live out here in the boondocks, right? So like, you got to get off the damn internet. Yeah. <laughs> so that was like the beginning of my journey into this. And it was funny because at the time I started out like with a lot of personal development and physical fitness and nutrition, all this stuff, because I had lost a bunch of weight because I was really overweight at one point in my life. I'd been bullied and picked on for it but also the mindset behind it because I went through a lot of trauma in my childhood. I went through severe abuse. My father was very angry and aggressive, very violent, scared the shit out of me my whole childhood. I felt very unsafe. And my sister was a heroin addict. And so I grew up in a household after I moved out of my dad's, I moved to my mom's house and I lived there for a few years. And we would literally have drug dealers in the middle of the night showing up at the house, banging on the door trying to collect money from my sister. And if, if she didn't have the money, they were trying to, you know, take her. So it was a very hostile environment. And, you know, I, I walked in on my sister, passed out on the floor from heroin and having a needle hanging out of her arm. And it was just a wild environment for a long time. On top of that, like all the anger and just rage from my father that I dealt with. And then I went through my own internal battles and struggles, which was alcoholism and suicidal depression and obesity and addictions, the porn and all this other crap. I went through toxic relationships with women. Basically, I went through all these like 20 years of suffering, if you will. And I woke up one day and I'm like, I can't continue to live like this. I can't keep being a victim of my life. And so I decided to start making changes and I started to change my mindset and I started to grow and become a better man and develop my emotions, my, open my heart back up because I was so closed down. So it was a really huge journey for me to overcome those obstacles of childhood trauma, which I'm sure most of your listeners can relate to. They've been abandoned by their father, criticized by their mother, some type of sexual abuse, some type of trauma. All of that gets locked in your nervous system. And then you repeat that in your relationships, in your life, in your job, in your profession. And you basically stay stuck at that like seven-year-old level or five-year-old level from when you were hurt. And I started realizing these things through thousands of hours of listening to podcasts, YouTube videos, and hiring mentors, going to seminars. I went and did all these things, but then I had all these realizations on my own because I had like those tools, but I'm like, okay, how do you actually use it? And it just completely blew my mind that we can live a life that is much more free and fulfilling, but it takes us really getting out of our own way, which is so important. So that's a, a small intro to the work I've gotten into. And that's really how I discovered polarity work and working with men to build a stronger masculine frame, working with women to soften into their natural feminine essence. And then the couples work, bringing them together and having a harmonious, balanced relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's the piece that I find. Well, first of all, it sounds you, like you've had quite the story. I can actually relate to the being in the job where you're like, this is not me. Like, this is not right. I actually worked when I graduated university, I got a, a job at a bank and I was the account manager. I was like early twenties, looked like I was 16, helping people with their mortgages and like all of there's, I did not know what I was doing. And about every day at two o'clock, I would just look around and be like, what is happening? Like, this is not going to be my life. So I ended up quitting living in my dad's basement. So I totally totally get that call. I was like driving home the day I quit listening to like Sugarland, <laughs> just like blasted. So yeah, I get the feeling like, you know, you need to make change, but you know, your past and your stories and your trauma and all of this stuff, like it's a hard process. 
You know I'm a huge lover of Element. It is my go-to electrolyte drink and a longtime sponsor of the podcast. So yes, Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar, no artificial ingredients, no coloring, no BS. It is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited if you're following a keto, a low carb, or a paleo diet. I just did the metabolic reset, which I've shared about on the podcast, and it was totally okay on that as well. Basically, if you're a professional athlete or you're just an everyday mom, it is for you. Element is a huge part of my day to day, whether it be rehydrating during workouts, when I'm traveling, after maybe a little too much wine in my cocktails and my mocktails, like I am always popping the element salt into my drinks. 100 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. I have one every day. Seriously though, about the cocktails, throw in some lime element salt with soda, tequila, lime, and mint. It is so delicious. So staying hydrated is a crucial and huge priority of mine. And proper hydration isn't just about drinking water. It means having adequate water and salt. And big news, Element just introduced Element Sparkling. So again, no sugar, there's no caffeine in this, all electrolytes. Element Sparkling delivers the same zero sugar electrolyte formulation that I have been telling you guys about. Now in a bold 16 ounce can of sparkling water. I couldn't have got better news. This is so exciting. I am such a fan of Element. Already put it in my soda water. So this is just, well, this just made my life so much easier. Element Sparkling offers health seekers an all new option to support their health across the board spectrum of occasions. So with each can, you're taking a sip against sugar and stimulant loaded drinks, and you're turning the tide towards health. I am so pumped for this. To grab some element, head to www.drinklmnt.com forward slash kickass stepmom and get a free sample pack with any drink mix purchase. That's just the drink mix purchase. I love these free sample packs because it just gives you a chance to try all the flavors and decide which one is your fave. Mine is watermelon. Darren loves lime. Head to www.drinkelement.com forward slash kickass stepmom to get a free sample pack with a purchase of a drink mix and keep your eye out for the new element sparkling. Seriously, cannot wait. Diving into the work that you're doing now, I find it so interesting and it's kind of something that I'm just kind of learning more about, like the masculine and the feminine and I have so many questions, just so many questions that I want to dive into with you. So can you explain a little bit about what you mean by that? Because I can imagine with where we're at right now and where the conversation with women is right now in terms of like going out, like boss babe, like super independent, own your future, all the things that you might get some backlash when someone's saying, or when you're saying you need to surrender and, you know, almost like submissive, the the man step into their power. So can you unpack all of that for me? Of course, I would love to. (laughs) You're like, yes. And that's the thing too, is we're living in a society right now that doesn't allow space for a woman to be feminine and a man to be masculine because that's not the agenda in our society. Like the agenda is to masculinize women, to burn them out from overworking themselves, to always have to be the leader, the decision maker, the provider, the protector. And women are so burned out and disconnected from their femininity because of this. And in the same regards, men have become very passive, emasculated, indecisive, wishy-washy, flighty, inconsistent. And I know that women listening to this who are dealing with these type of men, they're like, absolutely, I see that all the time. And men that are listening to this and they're seeing the guarded, controlling, critical, nitpicky women, this is because there's an imbalance in their energies. And now- For those of you that are not very familiar with masculine and feminine energies, all human beings embody both masculine and feminine energies. So a man can embody excess feminine energy. A woman can embody excess masculine energy. When she does, I'll go back to the woman, for example, because predominantly your listeners are mostly women, right? I would imagine. Yeah. So when a woman is embodying excess masculine energy, I always say like she becomes dried up, like her joy, her pleasure, 
her zest and passion for life, you can see a woman's physical body change. She becomes contracted. Her aura, like her energy field, it loses that glow and becomes very dark. And just like she becomes so rigid and, and very like intense with her energy because she's protecting herself. So a woman that is carrying excess masculine energy or she has become masculinized who is protecting herself is typically because of past trauma from abandonment from the masculine. And a, these are very, very triggering and hypersensitive conversations that I throw around sometimes very loosely. So if a woman is listening to this and she has past trauma and she hears me cer say certain things and it activates that in her body, she's going to have an emotional response and go, well, fuck this guy. I don't want to listen to this. But if she's open to receiving where I'm coming from to be able to feel safe to hear what I'm saying, it can activate something to heal a part of herself, right? So a woman that has been abandoned by the masculine has learned not to trust the masculine. Say her dad left her when she was five years old, or he wasn't emotionally present. He was working all the time. He was checked out. Another sneaky one here that comes in is the mother. The mother, maybe she had a mother who had excess masculine energy, who taught her not to trust men, who said men are no good, or whatever her story was. And she put all of that negative energy into that little girl. She then develops into a woman and becomes very guarded and cold and critical and shut down because she doesn't trust masculine energy. Once again, she's retracting because she doesn't feel safe. And when a woman doesn't feel safe, she overdevelops her masculine energy. She puts up this shield, which the shield, by the way, can look very good on the outside. She's successful in her career. She's a quote unquote boss babe. She's very independent, but it looks good on the outside. But on the inside, she's completely miserable. She's completely shut down. And she doesn't feel love. She doesn't feel joy. She doesn't feel pleasure because she is disconnected from her heart and she lives in her mind. And that to me is why so many women are struggling right now is because they've been pushed by societal programming, by trauma, and through many other forms, they've been pushed to be masculine, overly masculine, which is causing them to be so disempowered, so disconnected from what they really are, their natural joy and their natural radiance, that it's just, it's creating a world full of cold, robotic women. And then on the opposite side of this, at the same time, you have men, I'll talk about the typical nice guy, and then I'll get to the guy who is emotionally shut down. The nice guy is this passive, indecisive, people-pleasing, weak boundaries type guy who doesn't want to step up, assert himself who doesn't want to step up and take the lead because he's afraid of rejection. So he gets into a relationship, we could say, with this very masculine woman who is the leader, the provider, the decision maker, and she basically bosses him around and controls him. In the hindsight, he feels so disempowered and he's not getting the relationship he wants because he's in a relationship with a woman that just completely walks all over him and he follows her around like a little puppy dog with his tail between his legs, which he doesn't want that. No man with an ounce of masculinity in his body wants to be dominated by his woman mm -hmm. because that doesn't feel good. Just like no woman with an ounce of femininity in her body wants to be the decision maker all the time. She doesn't want to make all the decisions. She doesn't want to make all the plans. She doesn't want to lead the relationship. She wants to be able to sit back and be like, I trust that you'll take care of this, baby. I trust your leadership. I feel safe with you. Now, most women have never felt that in their entire life. So how can they do that, right? Like it takes a serious amount of work for her to first soften into that feminine space and for him to be strong in that masculine role. Yeah. This isn't saying that women aren't competent to take care of themselves because they absolutely can and they can do a great job of it. But if they want a masculine man in their life, there needs to be space for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I can imagine people listening to this random, like, well, if I soften and I let him take the lead, shit's not going to get done, right? Because you're in that pattern right now. Because I do feel like you're bang on with what women are feeling right now. There's just so much. We were just talking this on another podcast. And we say there's just so much pressure on women to, you know, be the boss, babe, have the career, you know, show up for the kids, keep the house, like do all of the things. And 
it does get you into this place where you are burnt out and there's not a lot of softness because you don't have a lot of time and faith, right? That someone is going to come in and and support you. So how do you even get out of that space? The part where you said, because there's like two parts to this question. The first part was, if I don't do it, nothing, no shit's going to get done. Second part is how do I get out of this space? The first part, if I don't do it, the shit don't get done is learning how to communicate from your femininity. So for example, if you're in a relationship with a man right now, and you feel like if you pull back and you're not the leader, you're not the one making the plans, planning your date nights and planning your trips and organizing everything and being the structure in the relationship. If you feel like you stop doing that and everything will crumble, which it may, but it could also greatly enhance your intimacy if you listen closely. When a woman learns to invite her man versus demand her man, it completely changes the dynamic of the relationship. Okay. Wow. Wow. A lot of women go, well, if I don't do it, he's not going to get shit done. And then she goes, hey, Johnny, I need you to take the trash out. (laughs) Yeah. And he's thinking to himself, how the fuck would I want to take the trash out for you? Like, that doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel like nourishing to me. But what if she comes over to him and she says, hey, baby, I would love it if you took the trash out tonight. (laughs) And she says it in like this kind of open, playful way. Now, if he's in his masculine frame, he's going to be like, well, fuck yeah, I'll take the trash out. I would love to take the trash out, right? Because there's an invitation there with her leading with that feminine joy, that feminine sensuality, which women do have. Even if you've like doled it right down to almost nothing, it's still there. There's still that smoldering flame or smoldering uh, coal, if you will, that could become a flame again, which is like your feminine radiance, right? So. Leading with an invitation to a man, sharing with him what you would love or what you would really desire from him versus making a demand and saying, you never meet my needs. You don't know how to love me. You're not emotionally available and project, project, project. You know what that does to a man? It shuts him right down. He becomes withdrawn because now he's meeting more demands. Okay. So if a man's in battle all day long, which most men are, all right, our minds are always in battle. We are always in go mode, competition. It's very hard to shut off the mind, right? Like, this is one of the things I teach my men is how to become more grounded and hold that strong masculine frame so you're not overwhelmed. If a man is in this battle mode and she comes to him in battle, he now views her as a threat. And she's in battle mode when she's making demands of him. You will never inspire a man's masculinity by making demands of him. When you invite him to step in, I would love it if you made plans for us to go out to dinner this week. Could you handle that for us, baby? Versus you never take me out to dinner, damn it. Like, why don't you take me out to dinner? This is bullshit. Now you've become a threat to him again. And as soon as you start threatening a man's masculinity, he's going to withdraw. Or he's going to get very angry and aggressive and want to battle with you because he now sees you as a masculine counterpart. But when he sees you as a soft, warm woman... That inspires him. Now, once again, I have to be very diligent with my words here. This will only inspire a man who is willing and ready to step in. If he is shut down in his emotions and he's not ready to step into his masculine, he's not ready to be tender and emotional with his woman, it won't mean shit what she does. How do you decide or learn if they're ready? Ooh. I just got to see. The tactical questions today. (laughs) So you start with the invitation, right? So it's the invitation of, I would love for you to step in. I would love for you to take the lead in our relationship because basically, to be honest with you, I'm burned out and I would love to be more soft and receptive to your leadership. Is that something that you could provide me with? Now, depending on where he is in life, he may say, I would love to do that. I would love to lead this ship. Or he may say, I got too much on my plate. I can't do that. So then you got to decide, is this the relationship I want to stay in? Because if a man is not willing to step in and meet your emotional needs, you got to really consider the man that you've chosen to be with. Yeah, for sure. I feel like there's a lot of men who are, they just kind of take that back seat because they've almost been conditioned by their woman. That's what she wants. She wants the control. She wants to take care of everything. Like she's going to do everything because 
I do think as women, we do go in and try to take control when we're feeling like unsafe and we're feeling like we need to protect ourselves or, you know, all of the narratives that are going on. So even just having that invitation and letting them, you know, I remember a conversation with my husband about date nights or things like that. And I said, you don't, you don't really surprise me with stuff anymore. He's like, well, you love to have control over everything. And I said, no, I would love it if you like booked the reservation or if you took control of that. I think we just kind of fell into that pattern. And he said, oh, I would love to do that. And it was just so interesting, just the dynamic switch, right? I assumed that he didn't want to do that or he didn't think it was a priority or he wanted me to take care of it. It was just like another thing on my list when, no, he just, you know, fell into that because of what I was doing. You know, I find when we get into this place of control, it's coming from a place of fear. So yeah, that was, it's just really interesting when you kind of like unpack all of that. And a lack of trust. Yeah, your lack of trust. And, and it is that protecting yourself. And, you know, the messages that society gives women right now, like there's just a lot. And it's almost normalizing that masculinity in women and glorifying it. It's celebrating it. It's celebrating and it's glorifying it. And hey, like, you know, boss babes, female entrepreneurs, like do your thing. Like I'm all about that. I love supporting female driven businesses and all the things. But when does the masculinity in that space impede on your ability to actually thrive? Does that make sense? Mm, well, it already is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just think about it. How many women in the world right now have that knee jerk response to step in, take over, be in control, micromanage, hover over him? Think about that. Most of the women that you would ask if they were being honest, if you were to say, what is your knee-jerk response to a man? They would say to be in control or to micromanage him or he won't get it done. I don't trust him. There's going to be some level of response there that has to do with control, lack of trust, micromanaging. That's there because women don't trust masculine energy. It, when a man's in a relationship with like that, he just throws up his hands. He's like, well, just whatever you want, babe. Just do whatever you want. Because he thinks that's what's serving her, but it ain't. That's not what's serving her. Yeah. What serves her is by him stepping in and say, hey, baby, I think this is what we should do. Or, hey, baby, I made his plans for Friday night at six o'clock to go to dinner. How does that sound? When a man steps in and takes charge and takes action and is consistent, it allows a woman's nervous system to relax and rest if she is willing to let go of control. But just like what you said, you're like, I noticed that I was controlling. Yeah. Oh, I notice I'm a little controlling sometimes <laughs> working on it. <laughs> and honestly, my wife is a great example of a woman that is so connected to her femininity, but still sometimes struggles with this stuff, right? You have to be receptive to a man's leadership if you want him to lead the relationship. That doesn't mean that he bosses you around and walks all over you and dominates you. That's not what I'm talking about here. If anything, it empowers a woman to be truly in her feminine space so she doesn't have to be in her mind all day long making decisions, doing tasks, taking care of technical shit because he can handle that. My wife is really good at like being able to inspire me to step into my masculine. She's very good at it. She can recognize when she's being controlling. She can recognize when she's being nitpicking and she's receptive to my boundaries when she is. What does that look like when... She's encouraging you to step into your masculine. Like, tell me a little bit about like how that looks in like the everyday of a relationship. That's a great question, honestly. So number one, it starts with her energy. She is the warmest, softest, most loving, nourishing space most of the time. I say most of the time because I never want to put a standard of perfection on any woman or man. So number one, her energy is so pure and loving. That right there inspires me to be a better man. Because I know what I have and I want to be a better man. I don't want to be watching porn, checking out OnlyFans, staying out late with the boys, you know, doing stupid shit because I have a good woman at home that loves me and really supports my mission. So that right there, first and foremost, is the number one thing that inspires me to be a better man every single day. Number two, there's some technical and tactical things that she does that I always kind of like think in my head right now. I'm like, she knows exactly what she's doing right now. Because I'm so aware of this shit, right? Like 
for example, sometimes I have a tendency to be more on the ramrod Rick that I have archetypes here. <laughs> Love it. Go for it. So I, t- I tend to be more like the ramrod Rick and I can be too aggressive sometimes. And now women have a lot of sensitivity and emotions. And sometimes when I'm too aggressive, I notice that I hurt her. And she'll say to me, instead of closing down, which she used to do, she'll open up and she'll say, hey, baby, don't you think that you could have delivered that a little bit more gently to me? And I'm just like, shit, you're right, I could have. And now if she said, stop being so damn aggressive with me, that would not make me feel inspired to want to step in. So like men are very reflective. Right. So if you activate that reflective part of their brain by getting him to think about what he just did versus telling him what he just did, it's a much better response. I mean, I could give you a hundred different examples, like how she really just like, if I'm not being clear about something, which I try to do a really good job at this, she will say, Hey, I would love for you to take the lead on this. Could you do that for me? Absolutely. I got it. Or, Hey, I need you to be clear with me right now. Can you do that? But I mean, fortunately, she doesn't have to say those things very often because I feel like I do a pretty good job of like being strong in my masculine frame, of being clear, being direct, being leading, being attentive to her needs. And it allows her to feel soft in my space. Like essentially a man is like a fence, right? And the woman is like the garden. When that fence is strong, it keeps out predators. Those little damn rabbits that come in and eat your favorite strawberries when they're just blooming, right? The strong fence of the masculine allows the feminine to soften and surrender in the relationship. And by surrender, people hear that word like, oh, I'm not being submissive. I'm not being, it's not about that. It's about being soft, connected to your heart, open to your femininity, open to your pleasure. That's really what true surrender is, like healthy surrender. It feels good, just like the wave surrenders to the shore when it lands on it and crashes down. It feels safe to let go and crash down. But in order for that to happen, that woman has to be so willing to trust and let go of that control. It all comes back to control. For a while there, Darren and I were out of sync. From our calendars to communication to what was going on in each other's lives, there was just so much going on that date night and connecting with each other fell off the list. And when we did have one-on-one time, Reese was with us. Surprise, surprise. It was just such a challenging time. And I know that you guys know when your relationship isn't solid, the extra stressors that come with step family life don't always feel worth it. So keeping your relationship on track is very important. Insert Coupla. So Coupla is a relationship app created for couples by a couple. It has helped thousands of couples connect using a shared calendar, to-dos, and reminders to spend more quality time together and connect on a deeper level. The calendar feature allows couples to easily manage each other's work and home schedules while also incorporating various family calendars into one convenient location. The calendar allows couples to prioritize date nights and quality time with each other and navigate through calendar conflicts and scheduling challenges that arise from juggling work, kids, exes, and more. Now, one of the big challenges that stepmoms have is that they aren't always in the loop about schedule changes with the kids. I don't know about you, but this used to drive me crazy. Coupla can help with this. When your partner adds a new schedule to the calendar, you will automatically be in the loop. You can also keep date nights on track with the date planner. As we all know, a regular dedicated time with your partner is one of the best things you can do for your relationship. But with work and friends and children and all the things demanding your attention, it can be hard to carve out that time to be together. So you can plan dates easily, get reminded about your upcoming dates, and keep your date nights on track. Coupla also has the only task manager and to-do list specifically designed for couples. Beyond simply managing groceries, couples utilize these lists to organize everything from planning their next vacation to managing a home renovation to curating exciting date nights ideas and keeping track of gift ideas. Coupla is offering a 50% discount off an annual subscription for my listeners for the first year. All you have to do is enter Jamie when you check out. You can get the link via my show notes, or you can also download Coupla from the app store. And after onboarding on the subscription page, you can click redeem offer and enter the code Jamie to get your discount. 
If you've been around since the beginning, you know that I created this platform and community 100% on my own. Google searches and podcast episodes and help desks are my business coaches, and that includes creating my website. Speaking of my website, if you've been on it in the last year or so, you know that it looks freaking amazing. Yeah, I know, humble brag, my website is bomb. I get a lot of questions about who designed it and how much it cost, and here's the deal. I did my own website. I just bought a template from Tonic Site Shop and customized it so that it's aligned with my brand, my messaging, and my style. Tonic Site Shop has redefined the website template. So throw out everything you think you know about creating a website and check out Tonic Stat. These are completely customizable websites designed for people who give a damn. I've heard people say that your website does not matter. That is complete crap. These days, your website matters big time. These templates are incredibly user-friendly with a drag and drop design. You use this intuitive platform called Show It to customize your website template without needing to know a single line of code. You just drag and drop like it's hot, no tears, no code, no limits. Head to www.jamiescrimger.com forward slash tonic to choose your template and then use the code Jamie15 to get 15% off. These templates are totally worth the investment and help me take my brand and my community to the next level. I can't wait to see what you create. I keep thinking, like as you're going through this, about, so my community, so we're a lot of blended families and stepmoms. And I think, you know, something that my husband has always done very well, and I hear you you talk about this in your content, is, is protecting your wife, like your manager protector. And I think that is just so powerful for women to know, like he's protecting me, like I'm safe with him and just in any relationship. And I think a lot of stepmoms struggle because they're in these dynamics. And I'd love your thoughts on this where, you know, he's been in a marriage before it hasn't worked. There's children involved. He's co-parenting with the ex and, you know, maybe the, the ex is attacking the stepmom or the ex is causing conflict that's, you know, creeping into their home and they're waiting for their partner to protect them. They're waiting for their partner to deal with this and to shut this down. And you have these men who are allowing this toxicity or, you know, the stuff from their previous marriage. So there's obviously like that's loaded too, right? Because he was protecting her at one point. But what are your thoughts around just kind of that dynamic and a husband's role in that? It's his duty and obligation as a man to preserve and protect his woman's femininity. So from any outside threat that may be. So if that is a controlling or toxic ex-wife, that is his duty and obligation to be very clear and direct with his boundaries and to not allow that to enter their relationship. When a man protects well, he doesn't allow outside influence into the relationship. Because there's already going to be stuff that happens inside those four walls, okay? You don't want extra people, intruders coming in to take from your inside your four walls. But men don't think about this. Like, oh, well, she can handle it. But women are so sensitive and have such different emotions than men. And I know people think that, well, that's a bad thing. No, it's not. It's just how they're wired. Women are so much more sensitive and emotional than men are. That's, we're more logical. That's just how we are. So a thing that might not bother a man will really drive a woman insane, right? So in the situation that you're talking about, he needs to have very clear and defined boundaries with his ex-wife. And if she is in this situation, coming to him and saying, hey, baby, I really don't feel safe with your ex-wife or I don't feel at ease with your ex-wife, could you please protect me in this space so I can feel safe? Like it's really about the words and the delivery of the woman. Like if you go to him and and you make a demand, once again, we're going back to the invitation versus the demand, and you say, I can't stand your ex-wife. Like you need to handle this, like take care of it. That is not inviting him to take care of it. If you come to him, you say, baby, I got to be honest with you right now. I do not feel safe with your ex-wife. I would love for you to protect me so I can feel safe in this space. Is that something that you can do for me? 
And he, hopefully, now once again, as an invitation doesn't mean that it's a guarantee. He steps up and says, you know what, baby? I can handle this. I'll take care of that. And then he approaches his ex-wife, sets a boundary with her, and he sets a, basically an outline for the relationship. Mm -hmm. You wonder how the dynamic of that previous marriage, if she's in her, like the ex is in her masculine and he, you know, wasn't stepping up, how that would play into the new relationship. The same pattern will continue if he doesn't heal it. Yeah. If the ex is so used to controlling, being demanding, you know, taking care of everything in that sense, and he doesn't set those boundaries, then you're going to end up with that in the same relationship. Well, he got there in the first place because he was afraid of her, right? So like, if you want to evolve as a man in your new relationship, you have to stop being passive and playing small and retracting yourself when you should be stepping up, setting a firm boundary and say, listen, I will not tolerate this behavior. And when a man begins setting those boundaries, people may not like it. My wife doesn't like it when I set boundaries with her. I can feel it in her body, her wanting to fight against me and to give me every ounce of attitude she has in her body, but she restrains. Like if my wife is being what I would consider to be having an attitude with me for no reason, like, you know, how women like to give an attitude sometimes for no reason, right? I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, no idea what you're talking about, right? Yeah. And I'll pull her aside and say, hey, baby, I don't like the way you're talking to me right now. I need that to stop. And she'll look at me and like, it's like her shoulders will kind of go up and then they'll go back down. And she's like, you can almost hear like that bulb, like see the bulb in her mind go off. And it's like, fuck, he's right. I'm giving an attitude for no reason right now. And then I'll, I'll follow up with after she, you know, lets down that shield. Is there something that you need to talk about to make sure that she's in a good space? Right. So it's like, maybe she's giving me attitude from something I did earlier in the day and I didn't catch it. Right. And if she says that, then we can talk about it. And I'll listen. I want to hear what she has to say. What does it look like when the woman sets some sort of boundary with the man? If she's feeling like he's being maybe a little too aggressive or attitude or whatever, just kind of going back to what you were saying, like when you say like how your wife had approached that with you, just saying it that way. Yeah. I mean, it's very similar, right? <laughs> I'm going to go to a pain point for a lot of women right now. When a woman sets a boundary, she tends to over explain herself instead of just being very clear and direct. Okay. If you really want to get a man's attention, you really have to get him in like that first 20 to 30 seconds of your delivery. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I always say that men are like the highlights of a story. Women are like the cliff notes, right? Yeah. No, women are like the whole story. Men are like the highlights. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's like when your husband is telling you a story about what happened, like even last night, my husband's trying to tell me a story about a conversation he had. And I said, and then what did they say? I said, no, you've it's like the details, like we're very detail oriented. Very. That's exactly it. You're very detail oriented and you love the whole story where men are just like the highlights. So when a woman comes to a man and she wants to deliver a boundary, if she explains her entire boundary and why she's setting it, the boundary never gets explained or never gets laid. But if she's like, Hey, baby, I really don't like when you do that. Can you please not do that again? Versus like, you know, when you do that, I feel a certain way and it makes me feel like this. And then, you know, when my friend Judy had this happen to her and she starts going off, like, like veering off a whole other path. It's like, no, state your desire. You're not talking to one of your girlfriends. State your desire. You're talking to a man. Be clear, be direct. Hey, baby, I really don't like when you do that. Can you please not do that again? It's such a more effective way versus like this long form communication, these long text messages that men never read. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how women communicate with other women. Like, for example, another perfect example, me and one of my boys want to get together on a Friday night and have a nice fire. Hey, you want to hang out Friday night? Yes. What time? Six o'clock. Cool. What do you want to do? Have a fire. Awesome. See you then. Three, four sentences, right? Women, when they talk, hey, you want to get together on Friday night and have a fire? Yeah, that sounds so good. What should we wear? And then, well, I got this red dress already picked out in my closet that I've been dying to have, right? So maybe we could bring some wine. Should I bring some snacks? Like they just go on for hours in this dialogue <laughs> of like all the details of the entire, because they want to experience the fullness of that moment. Right. Where men are just like, 
Give me the logical steps. Tell me where to be and I'll be there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's just how we operate. <laughs> That's so good. So when a woman communicates to a man like a woman, guess what? She either A, emasculates him because now he's all in his feminine and he's like, oh baby, that looks so nice. And yeah, we should talk about that, right? Yeah. So A, she emasculates him or B, she doesn't never gets to the result that she wants. So there's two things that are going to happen there. But this third option, which is option C, clear communication with a man. I would love for blank. Can you please give me blank? And it's two, three sentences. Well, all the feelings and emotions you have, just deliver from that short punch. And then when he says yes, then you can open up more and express what you're feeling, right? And he can hold containment for that. So it's like the first step is getting that clear communication across. So he's like, yes, this is what I need to do. Men need actionable, deliverable steps. If you give him a whirlwind of emotion and he doesn't know what to do with that, right? I can't metabolize that. I don't know what the hell to do with that. If you take a fire hose and you spray it in my mouth, you're going to drown me. But if you give me just a little bit of a water hose, I can drink out of that. Yeah, that's so good. But once again, women might hear that and they may be like, well, he's telling us to repress ourselves because I've heard this before when I've taught women this style of communication. Try it with your man and tell me if you feel repressed. When you finally start getting the results that you want with your man, are you going to feel repressed? No, you're going to feel empowered because you're like, holy shit, he actually just took the lead on that. He made a plan. He listened to my needs. He listened to my boundary. But why did he listen? Because he knew what to do. You gave him clear communication. We'll go into sex. We'll talk about sex. Everybody loves talking about sex. You're in a bedroom with your man. Things are getting hot and heavy, right? And he starts going down on you. Oh, we are talking about sex. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, so he starts going down, you know, things are getting hot and heavy, right? But all of a sudden, he does something you don't like. Now, what do you do in that situation? Do you give him a little bit of guidance and you say, you know, put your hand there or, or do this? And like, you just like give him that guidance because you are the guide, right? So it's like you are guiding him in that moment. I always say women are like the sexual gatekeepers, but you're also the emotional gatekeepers in a lot of ways as well. So it's like, give him that little bit of guidance, give him that little bit of encouragement, like, oh, baby, I love when you do it like this. Could you do it like that? Like, give him that like soft, gentle warmth versus either A, shutting down or say, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> right? That doesn't inspire a man. So give him the blueprint to how to love you, okay? You do it in the bedroom, you do it outside the bedroom, you do it with your communication, all these different levels. You're teaching him how to love you, essentially, with your communication. And men like that. We men, we hear that, we're like, shit, she likes that, I'm gonna do more of it. Because that's how we operate. We actually really have a deep desire I would say most men, if he's a good man, to truly serve his woman, right? Like we want to give you a beautiful experience, but we often don't know how to best do that. And we're just guessing at it a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And it's hard when we have these walls up and aren't being open about our needs. That's a whole other part to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm really interested in is just to go back. How did you go through this healing process? Because you talked about you know, your relationship specifically with your dad and you know how he was very aggressive and all of that. And I did see there was a reel on Instagram and you guys went to go pick up a truck. <laughs> He's so funny. God, that was funny. And he does seem like a very like aggressive, abrupt, no bullshit. He's old school, man. Yeah. I loved it. It was so funny. And, uh, what was that process like for you and going through and healing and, you know, still having those relationships with your parents or with people who have hurt you? And, you know, getting to this place where you're at now, like what's that been like for you? Oh, it's, it's been an ongoing process, to be honest with you. You know, for a long time, I held a lot of hatred in my heart towards my father. And we even got to one point where I blocked him for six months and I was never going to talk to him again. At this point, I had moved to Texas from my hometown and I just couldn't stand him at this point. And I remember just thinking to myself, like, I'm just done with him. And it took me a lot of boundaries and forgiveness to really let go of those core wounds and the anger I was holding on towards him. And it still comes up sometimes. But at the core of it all, what I really wanted from my dad that I never got was like, I'm proud of you, son. You are good enough. I love you. I'm sorry. I never got those things. And this like makes me honestly a little bit emotional talking about it. Becoming a father myself, 
and being that to my son, I make sure that I give him them things. Well, of course, with boundaries and strong love, but I make sure that I give Coda those things because I know how important it is to a man to receive that from his father. And I was thinking about this the other day. If I got up and left and never spoke to Coda again and abandoned him, no matter what, how good Melissa is as a mom, that kid is still going to be messed up for the rest of his life. And he's got some serious trauma to work through, right? And even when a, a father is present, he can still emotionally abandon like his son. And I know women go through this as well, but that will mess a woman's relationship up to men for the rest of her life, right? So it's like, my dad didn't love me. How could any other man love me? He created me. Half. He was half my creator. So if he couldn't even love me, then how could anyone? So then she has this unconscious programming of, well, I can't trust men. So with my healing journey, Honestly, I remember the, the day I came across his word forgiveness and it just was like rang true to me. Like you got to forgive your dad. And like, it was like almost like this, like this message in my mind. And I sat down on my couch and I started to like close my eyes and visualize my father's face. And I just felt all the anger in my body I was holding on to towards him. And I remember just crying so deeply. Like you could hear the teardrops just like pounding the floor below me because I was so angry at my dad. I had so much shame and anger in my body, in my nervous system, because I just like, I felt like I hated him, you know? So it took me many years of that to just really release that, to be free from it. And I think a lot of men in our society are holding on to that abandonment of their father. Like I have friends that have actually physically been abandoned by their father. And that wound is so deep. It messes that man up for the rest of his life until he heals it. And then he's the one that breaks the generational trauma. Like, I'm not going to do that shit to my son. At least I don't plan to, and I'm not gonna. If I have any control over my mind and my actions, I will take accountability and show up as the best that I possibly can. And it's very hard. Like my son right now, he's nine months old. The other day, my dad actually did something that pissed me off and triggered me. We were going to be moving a, I had gotten a new sauna and the sauna was in the garage and I had had him come down to help me. And at the time I didn't have a tractor. <laughs> I had not bought mine yet, but he had a tractor. So I said, Hey dad, you want to come down and help me? Yeah, yeah, I'll be down. And he said, what time? I said, 930. He said, all right. He shows up. I hear something out in the garage at 9am. And I'm like, what's he doing out there? Like, I need to help him with this thing because it's a huge thing. It's got glass everywhere. But my dad is very impatient. So he starts like trying to lift the thing by himself. I'm holding my son at this point and I scream out at him I'm like, dad, stop. I don't want to do it yet. You're pissing me off. I got really upset. And I felt like I had failed in that moment because I was holding my son and I yelled at my dad in front of him and I just felt like such shit as a result to it. And so it took me about 20 or 30 minutes to cool down. I walked back inside and I gave Melissa my son. And I took 20, 30 minutes to cool down a lot of deep breathing because I didn't want the rest of my day to go like that. And I said to him, I said, dad, I go, I apologize for yelling at you like that. This is not the type of relationship I want to have. And I was just very clear and direct. And he just looked at me and said, it's okay. I forgive you for that. And then what I did, I went upstairs into my bedroom where Melissa was, she was feeding Coda. And I said, hey, buddy, I want to talk to you for a minute. Now I know he's nine months old. And he doesn't fully understand English, but he can feel energy. And I said, daddy didn't mean to yell like that. I'm sorry about that. So it's like taking accountability as a father, leading your household, not only shows my wife that, shows my son that, and also shows my father that. So we as men, we really have to lead our households effectively by controlling our own emotions. Because if your emotions are dysfunctional, chaotic, what do you do? You blow up, you turn to addictions, you're playing video games, you're overworking yourself, you're watching porn, you're hitting the vape, you're doing all this shit to numb yourself. Yeah, that hits hard for me. I feel like we have so many parallels just in our story because I have a lot of abandonment issues with my mom. There was times where I was like, I'm never talking to her again. Like, I'm done. I don't want this in my life. Why did you feel abandoned by her? So my parents... <laughs> split when I was in the second grade. And 
I was just really struggling. I had a lot of behaviors and I was really struggling with that. So my parents split before there was kind of 50, 50. So we lived with my mom for most of the time. And I just was always acting out. And she moved us to another town with her new boyfriend who they had had an affair. So it was like a whole thing. And I was living there. I was just was being bad. I was acting out. I was so hurt. You know, if you look back at it from what we know now, I was just traumatized. We had just been ripped out of my home. My family had been taken apart, like all the things. So I'm in the fourth grade at the time. I would call my dad every night because that was our hometown. Can you come pick me up? Can you come pick me up? And I, my poor dad just getting this because he can't, right? There's court orders, all the things. And eventually she let me go, uh, go live with them. I called him like probably every day for eight months. And so I went and lived with my dad and my mom never really called, right? There was never really going back and forth. I never really had a relationship with her here and there we would, but you know, I had my three younger siblings and so they were all close with her. But, you know, I think for the longest time, I really, I felt unloved. I felt unworthy. I was, you know, I had huge walls up to protect myself. And I, I know I wasn't the easiest person to parent, but you know, parents need to be there for their kids. And so, you know, I think that was just such a, huge thing for me to go through. And I've had to do boundaries. I've had to remove myself from situations. And it's interesting when you say like the things that I've needed my dad to say, my mom will never say what I need. She's never going to give me what I need. And I think the forgiveness process in that is accepting that, right? Like almost grieving the relationship that you thought you'd have or that you wanted and then breaking, you know, that cycle and giving that to your to your child. And, you know, the way I show up for my daughter is completely different. And how you're saying that, you know, with your son, it's just so interesting how when you have a baby of your own, all of the things that you maybe didn't even think were as traumatizing for you or as triggering for you, it's like all of this stuff comes up. eh? Yeah, very much so. It's powerful too, like becoming a parent and a father myself. It's been so transformative. You know, like you just want to be better. You want to be more present. You don't want to be distracted. Like all these things, it's like, because he's becoming like me, you know? So he watches me. Like when Melissa and I, well, we always do this, but like when Melissa and I like hug each other or kiss and like hold each other, like in front of Coda, we'll like stop in a moment and we'll kind of look down. There's Coda. Just like staring right up at us, watching us, how we connect and like, He knows and understands love, but he also understands fear and pain. So like the more love and communication and connection we can show him, the better off he's going to be, the more tools he's equipped with, right? He's not going to be perfect. No kid will, but it's really about giving him the tools to be successful in life and to feel good as a human. And to learn how to how to react and how to repair. I think that's really powerful what you were saying too. And I don't think our parents, even in that generation, were really into the whole repair, acknowledge your own contribute, right? It was just a different time. And in that respect, I have the empathy for my mom and for, you know, parents in that generation. They didn't have the tools. They didn't have, they weren't diving into the personal growth and really seeing things the way that we see them now. Yeah. It just, it makes it easier to forgive them. Right. When it's like, they were just doing what they needed to do with what they had. And was it right? I don't know. But I feel like that helps with the forgiveness process as well. Yeah, it's definitely hard as hell. You know, it it takes a lot of inner work to really let that go. And it may still come up from time to time. And that's when you just like to have to have a little bit of grace for yourself to not be so hard on yourself. Like, well, why do I still feel anxious sometimes? Well, you're human and you're learning to figure out your emotions and you're probably working through past trauma. You know, like so many people are just so quick to just beat themselves up. And I know with women, a lot of it is shame. Women carry a lot of shame around how they look, how they present themselves. And they carry so much heaviness and shame in their body, but it doesn't serve them. And you see it in our world today. And and obviously like the marketers just prey on that with all this makeup and everything else to make a woman look more beautiful unnaturally. But And her natural essence and her femininity is really where she shines the most. And you can feel it in a woman that embodies that. It just glows through her. Like the natural beauty. Yeah. Like her shame being released is better than any makeup she could ever wear. Right? So it's going to just glow through her and like just radiate. I always call it the feminine radiance. Like she just has that aura 
And a man is so attracted to that. It's magnetic, right? We want to be near that. We want to be a part of that. Just like the sun finds the flower to penetrate as a flower opens in the morning. It's just like the openness of a woman's heart. The masculine wants to penetrate that. Literally. No. <laughs> Sorry. I had to. Yeah. Well, literally, emotionally. I had to. I had to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jake. This has been so good. You went there. I didn't. <laughs> you shifted the conversation at one point. So I... <laughs> <laughs> This has been so good. Thank you so much for taking time. Where can everyone find you? I'm most active on Instagram. And my Instagram is just underscore Jake Woodard, W-O-O-D-A-R-D. I have a podcast as well called The Awake with Jake Show. Got a couple hundred episodes over there. So good. Well, I appreciate just the work that you're doing. And you're, you know, there was some things that you say that I was like, oh, you know, that could trigger women or that could be perceived in the wrong way. But how do we heal though? Yeah, it's how do we heal from that and hear that? When you go to the gym and you're uncomfortable, like, do you feel like, you know, you're not supposed to feel comfortable when you're growing and healing. It takes you looking within yourself, looking at your shit and going, oh, that kind of hurts. But why does it hurt? Why does it trigger you? And you sit in that feeling of that. And that's where our growth is as humans. Like when we look at our triggers and we go, wow, I get so easily triggered by the ideology of being strong and independent. Well, if you're strong and independent and you're not fulfilled in your love life, maybe there's a correlation there. And that could be a really huge blind spot that you haven't seen. Wow. That was a good way to end it. That was a banger. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jake. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. That's it for this one. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if this episode resonated with you, I'd be so grateful if you could share it with someone in your life who you think could benefit from it. And if you haven't already left a rating and a review on iTunes, it really is the best way to support the show. And if you're craving more real talk and coaching and community, be sure to check out my membership, the Kick-Ass Stepmom community. Head to www.kickassstepmom.com to learn more.